So what I'm going to do is going to just give you a brief introduction to this deal, and mostly I'm going to talk about the history that I've sort of seen for the last, I hate to say it, about 30 years. Um, I was interviewed recently and about my work, and I said, you know, why is it taking so long, 30 years to do this problem? <laughs> And I said something, well, the computer is really stupid. I'm not, and I'm not smart enough to teach the stupid computer, and that's why. Uh, but I'll sort of go through uh, sort of general overview here. So what is optical music recognition? Why is it important? And, and the history, brief history. Uh, talking about some obstacles and challenges in the past. So what is optical music recognition? So, I say it's a process of converting images of music scores into a symbolic computer representation such as MIDI, Music XML, or MEI, which stands for Music Encoding Initiative, which I like to promote all the time. So basically you have an image, it's just an image, bitmap, or we used to call it, uh, and that gets converted to some file format the computer can read in a symbolic format. And that process, what's in between, is what's called the OMR. All right, so some of the steps involved in OMR, you have to start with the digitized score, you do some image processing, do some symbol recognition, and we have to, once we recognize the individual symbols, we sort of put it together and produce the output. So in each of these steps, there are several steps inside, things like binarization that's usually done. Uh, we may remove some noise, we may do other sort of uh, image pre-processing. Uh, then what we do, what's called the structural analysis or document analysis. That's when we figure out what parts of the image is important. Things like uh, actual stage, uh, where there's text, there might be some other things such as some pictures or large initials in the old, old manuscripts. So that's the structural analysis. Then once we find them, we separate them out, usually so that they can be treated separately. So in particular, uh, we do most, most of the time we do the character recognition, that's called the OCR, right? Optical character recognition separately from OMR. Uh, then after you do that, so we're basically left with mostly with music symbols, and most of the time, we do what's called the stage staff. Staff, you know, those five line stage, uh, or four lines uh, in the early days, and we usually remove them. Uh, you'll see why later. Uh, then once you do that, it's much easier to separate individual symbols that were on the stage. And then we do the classification. So this is usually uh, where each each of these sort of glyphs, as we call it, are sort of named or classified. Then after that, once all of each individual symbols, things like note heads, stems, beams, are recognized, then we have to put it back together. Uh, one of the things we have to know is the clef, right? Usually music has clef, and without the clef, and perhaps key signatures, we don't know what the pitches are. And if we don't know what the beams or flags, uh, are recognized, we don't know what the rhythmic values are, the note length, so we have to put all that back together. Uh, then we put the whole thing together, things like different stays, where there are breaks, maybe it's a string quartet, score, you have four parts, you know, you have to rearrange, sort of put it all back together, then finally we have the uh, final output. So that's usually the general workflow of uh, OMR. I'll go through this a few more times and later speakers will talk more about that. So, <clears throat> why is it important? Uh, there are several reasons. One of the clearest examples is probably automatic playback. So once you have the score, you can rearrange it so you can play it on any instrument combination you like. Um, and we do this from the score so that each part can be e easily separated. To a certain extent, we can now do audio to score, 
But there's still some information that are lacking, and it's really hard to separate the instrument. So often it's easier uh, to get the score in a computer format from the score image of the score rather than from the audio. So we can do different types of arrangements. We can do transpositions. Singers once all the time they, they they have a music and they want to transpose it to their own vocal range. So that's transcription. Change of mode is not easily done with audio. So you know going from minor minor to major. That's another example. Um, the big one is uh, symbolic music analysis. So we have a large amount of data in score format, then we can just start doing uh, search through all this database, and we can do data mining, right? Different different periods, different location where the music came from, and we can do what's called a distant reading. So that's sort of statistical uh, view, a large scale view of the repertoire that you're interested in, and we can do that easily. Uh, this is where there's some commercial aspect uh, of this technology. One of the reasons this whole area probably hasn't developed as fast as OCR is probably there was not that much money to be made. But uh, I, actually, I was approached early in uh, early eight nineties uh, where they wanted to reprint the hymnals, the hymn books that you see in churches, right? And they didn't have the original plates where they made the prints from, so they wanted to basically republish it. Uh, reprint them, but they didn't have the easy way to print them again using the original plate. So they went to OMR, the thing, and uh, reprinted uh, the results. Uh, the technology wasn't quite there, so they didn't actually use it, but they did invest a little money for that. And that's the only time I ever not had this software in open source. Uh, they, because I, I insist that I liked it everything open source public domain, but they said, well, maybe maybe for half a year you, you won't publish anything, so I said, okay, fine. So I didn't publish for half a year, um, but then it, it's all back in open source. Um, Braille, this this, be, this is almost doable. It's, it's not quite that difficult once you get it in. There are Braille prints, uh, so we can do that, and I think this would be really, really useful uh, to a lot of people. Um, in Canada, actually, there is a, a free service offered by the government where they will take sheet music, you know, whatever came up, and they'll do it, uh, they will convert it to Braille. Unfortunately, it takes about six to eight months. So by the time you get it back, you know, your, your favorite pop song is no longer in, in uh, pop, in, in, it, it's no longer uh, interesting to sing or play from. So this would be a really nice one. And finally, uh, there's parts of this OMR process can be used for score following. That is, you have audio playing live or recorded, and you follow the score. People like to follow the score uh, as the music's going. So there are, these are some of the applications that OMR can be used for. Okay, so let me start at the beginning. So there were two uh, dissertations from the early 60s, both came from MIT, and one in 66 and one in 70. The reason they came from MIT is because they had a scanner. Uh, that's the big thing, uh, and that's allowed them, nobody else had access to a scanner back then, so that was one of the reasons they were able to do this fairly early. I'll get back to that. So this is the first guy, Dennis, uh, also known as the tool, uh, and we have MIT in 59, he's now a grandfather uh, with his grandson. So, you know, he's been doing this, well, he did this a long time ago. The other guy, David Perot, uh, is now an expert on daylight savings time. So, uh, he, I guess they both didn't do the OMR. All right. <laughs> So this is, this is the very first printed uh, uh, scan of music. Um, and this is about the only thing he did. He only could do two measures. Actually, the, the guy before, Presley, only did one measure of this. That's all they could analyze. That's all they could fit. Uh, 
scan and fit on the computer to do. But still, this was the initial try. Uh, in 1904, in Japan, uh, they built this robot. It's very impressive. So this is a real-time accompanist. So it was, it was I'd never seen this, but apparently there was a demo where a singer, a human singer will sing, and this robot reading the music that's right here, and there's a camera, and it'll play along. Uh, this robot is actually still in Japan, in Scuba. If you ever uh, visit Scuba University, you can go and visit. It's still, it's now, it didn't move, but it's still there. So, but this is in 84, and that's very, very early. Uh, I think there was, well, this is out of, it's called Wabat, because it was done at Waseda University. Uh, they had a very impressive engineering department, they still do. And I think there were about 50 people involved building this robot. Uh, imagine, this is over 30 years ago, right? So, okay. Now, here's some of the OMR thesis or dissertation that came out since 66. Uh, what I like you to notice that they come in bursts, right? So there's the first period, there was 66 and 70, then there was a break about 18, 19 years, where I did my master's in Nicholas Carter, it is dissertation. Then again, there's a break, about seven years, and there was a four of them, four of us, uh, who are all still work, sort of working on this, but all came out all at the same time. Then there was another break, about nine years, then Laurent, Pujan, and others um, came. Then after that, it's coming along uh, every two or three years. So the last one here is Jorge, sitting right there, so we'll talk about his work. Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll try to explain why this happened. Uh, so one of the reasons is, as I said, we didn't have a scanner. So this was the scanner in around 1960 at US Census data. This whole thing. With the scanner, they used all this to do a scanning of this microfilm that they photographed the, the census data, right? It was just a room, room uh, with air conditioning because there were tubes and everything, and it's and we didn't have. Well, I obviously didn't have access to that. Um, actually, in '83, uh, in Japan, actually, uh, this what's called the flatbed scanner was apparently introduced. I, I wasn't aware of that then, but even then it costed lots of money. You know, there, this could have been thirty, forty thousand dollars 40000 Then, uh, so I didn't have a scanner, but I really do, wanted to do OMR, and I was taking an image processing class at Miguel, as a graduate student. So this is how I did OMR in 83. So I made a photocopy, Xerox, of a score I was interested in, I made a transparency, you know, the clear plastic you can make a uh, photocopy of that. I bought lots of graph papers, large ones, on the large classroom, like, yeah, sort of like this room, um, at night when nobody was using it, and I taped the graph paper to the blackboard, all of it, so we covered the blackboard, right? and I put the transfers of the score on the overhead projector, right? Then I projected the score into the blackboard with the graph papers, and I manually blocked out all the black pixels of that page, right? I mean, I think I only took one night. Um, uh, then I punched it, it was still, we were still using computer cards, punch cards, uh, and I used what's called the round length coding, which means you just count the number of blacks you put that number next, you put the number of whites, black, and so on, so I just compressed, so I could do that. Then I wrote a program in Pascal, and ran it on mainframe. So that's, that was sort of my initial run at OMR. Uh, so that was in 83, because, you know, we didn't have um, a scanner. So the guys at MIT have what's called a flying spot scanner, so they were uh, able to do that. But desktop scanners came in commercially, on North America, about 84, 10,000, which is about $24,000 today in today's dollars. There's still a lot of money. And so here it is, data copy model ID, and it's the most high 
high quality digital system now costs between $25,000 and $300,000 out of the reach of many businesses. So obviously we could not afford that. A uh, year later, Datacopy came up with a cheaper model, but less than half the price. Uh, it was, was a little too hard to ask my professor to buy one. But, uh, so here it is, Datacopy 700. And a, year after, oh, a couple of years after, finally came down to about $1,800 then, and uh, uh, Datacopy $1,800. So, which was so bad, so I asked um, a professor to buy one. So this is the one I used actually, and this was 200 dot per inch um, resolution with eight bit grayscale. <clears throat> Today, in 2018, you can get this Canon LID 120 and for $60 and 2400 dpi and 24 bit color. So, I mean, much cheaper now. Um, anyway, I still have this. It's not working anymore. But I just took this last week on my desk. So this is what it looked like. This was very important for me to use this. All right. So I want to talk a little about the image file size, right, in general. So a scanner at 200 dpi at 8 bit per dot or eight, 1 byte per pixel, right, um, will take um, about 3.7 megabytes, okay? That doesn't seem a lot to you, I'm sure. Uh, this projector, I'm projecting now, up here, uh, takes 1.4 meg. You know, my iPhone, this is 750 by 1334, uh, that's about 3 megs. That's, that's the resolution of my iPhone screen, right? Uh, so you could potentially uh, do the 200 dpi full page. Color scanner at 600 dpi on the other hand, that's what we normally recommend to do OMR. Uh, a page will take about 100 megabytes or more. Um, depending on. So, so those are the sort of the order of magnitude image files that we have to deal with. Now, I was using PCs in the 1980s, so was most people. So, when I, PC XD came out, 85, 640, and 10 megabyte hard disk. Um, Apple came out, uh, slightly larger uh, memory, and 20 megabyte was the external hard disk, it was a big box. Um, so, remember the scanner, 200 dpi? Uh, that's 3.7 megabytes. So that obviously not going to fit in the memory. If you look at, um, let's say you do, let's say we're not doing a whole eight inch wide, considering margins. Let's say you have only six inches of music, 200 dpi. So one scan line takes 533 pixels, right? And that's just one line. So to do an inch, right, you need 200 of those, 200 line of those. Right, so you can only do about within 640k. I mean, I'm mean, I'm being generous because that 640k has to include your operating system and your program, right? So I really don't have 640, um, but doing that, so I'll, it's clear that we only have we can only work with basically one staff or at most double staff at a time back then. Okay, so moving on in 2000. Uh, we developed this software called Gamma. It was a framework for creation of structured document recognition system designed for domain experts, meaning musicians or musicians who can read uh, music and they can correct. Uh, we had uh, standard image processing tools uh, built in, so we didn't, we're not reinventing the wheel. And we had primitive document segmentation analysis and then we did the symbol segmentation and classification. We call my little chart at the beginning. Uh, then it was made to be portable, extendable, simple. It was open source. It was GUI, uh, which, is, which was a big thing. Don't forget, the original IBM PCs didn't even have uh, graphics, right? It was just characters you only saw. And you have to, we actually had to buy a separate graphics card to be able to see uh, sort of the vector graphics. So GUI was important, and also batch. So we were thinking, 
way ahead of time because we didn't do a lot of them. But in order to do uh, a large amount of scores, we didn't want to be clicking uh, and selecting many items. So we made, it, made sure that it was command line batchable. It does stand for GAMRA, Generalized Algorithm and Methods for Enhancement and Restoration of Archives. Uh, of course, you may know that this is also a native Anyways, so the birth of Gamera, it happened on my birthday in 2001. It's our 17th anniversary, based on my, my dissertation, um, called Adaptive, because it, it's, it was a learning system, still is. Uh, it was mentioned in J.C. Dale, but actually, uh, it was first presented uh, at Izmir, uh, what, 17 years ago. Uh, so this was our first paper given at Disney. Okay, so some early screenshots. So we ran this on Linux. Uh, so we, dis we did this on Python. It was very early uh, implementation of Py by Python. And we actually went to Python conferences because they were interested in this. Uh, so this is actually showing some thresholding or binarization. So this is the histogram of different grade level here, so we can figure out where we can cut to make it either zero or one. I'm showing that. So here, you can enter your, um, your commands by Python. You can have it obviously scripted. Um, and that's how we're doing this uh, camera processing. Okay, some features of camera. This is around 2008. So some of the pre-processing, uh, we had sort of the automatic brightness enhancement. Uh, at a uh, Photoshop, uh, but automatic. Uh, the old manuscripts come in different conditions, um, and also some early digitization uh, work didn't have a very good good lighting or good color preservation, so we have to do the same. Uh, this is binarization. You notice that we have what's called a bleed through, so the ink from the other side seeps in after a few hundred years, um, so we need to do that. Uh, the big problem, and I'm sure you'll hear about this later, uh, is the staff line. One of the reasons is that if you want to identify symbols, right, these uh, note heads, computers can't really do this because computers are notoriously bad for finding, figuring out what's in the foreground and the background. Humans are extremely good at this, uh, you know, early robots always had to bump into things because they couldn't figure out, you know, if they were going somewhere and there's something in front of it, they couldn't figure that out. Uh, so, one of the reasons we like to do staff line removal is so that we can segment it, we can separate all the uh, symbols. So, this is a fairly good way, easy way. This was an easy example. It gets a little harder. So, in the old days, they didn't even use like printers or rulers, often they're just hand drawing, uh, so they're not even equidistant or parallel. Um, but this is not so bad, so if you just look for sort of thin horizontal-ish line with certain thickness, you can get rid of most of it. Uh, the trick is not to remove what's on the front, right? Because you want to preserve what's on the front but get rid of just the things that are just staff lines. This is my favorite example. If you follow this uh, staff line, it kind of crosses. Um, I thought this would be difficult, uh, but I think we have a solution now. We can even solve this problem. Uh, you'll find out later. The, the monk, you know, these are monks copying, so I get a little too many beer, I'm sure. Um, <clears throat> So we can do it for other things. This is a loop tablature. Uh, again, we can remove most of the staff lines. Uh, so here's the original uh, classifier in Gamera. So you were given different classes, and you can assign different classes to different symbols. And this uses a KNN 
the nearest neighbor classifier. Um, these were identified. Uh, so the same color means they're they are connected components, right? So all the pixels are attached to each other one way or another. Uh, so that's how we sort of separate or segment the different symbols. Uh, we can even do it with uh, any symbol actually, uh, because it wasn't really designed specifically for music. Um, so any sort of symbol-based document we can deal with. Uh, there are other applications, so this is a beautiful Byzantine chant notation uh, now with Christopher Dall Christoph Dallas, who now maintains the Gamera website. Uh, here's another one uh, showing uh, a loop temperature. So even if you can't, so this is one of the advantages of doing OMR, right? So even if you can't read this, you might be able to read that. Or if you can read that, but not that, right? Uh, okay, I have to mention, I'm going to go back in time a little bit. So 2002, about at the same time we were developing Gamera, there was a uh, software called Earthfix. Uh, this was developed by Laurent Pajan, uh, and this was specialized what's called a typographic music. So type is character type, right? Everything has a font, and each, these are called type, and they put it together to do characters. At a certain time in the 16th, 17th century, they also used type for music, right? So every one of these little things was a type. So they had a different type for every note, uh, for every, you know, the two stem directions. Uh, and so that's how they did this. And this, this Arispix OMR program is specialized for that. One nice thing is that there's no slurs or beams or uh, a lot of uh, leisure lines. So that made it a little simpler. Uh, he used the hidden markup model. Um, so this is this was uh, one of the first to use this hidden markup model for um, we. <laughs> okay, so one cool thing about this is that he doesn't remove stop lines. So this, uh, yeah, for most uh, OMR, we like to remove stop lines because it's easier to do the symbol segmentation later. Uh, but uh, he doesn't remove stop lines. Or he had a paper where you, you don't remove stop lines either, right? But in most 95% of cases, we remove the stop lines. Welcome to Arispix. We are now in the optical recognition part of the application. Let's start by opening an image scanned from microfilm. We can see that the image is not very clean, the borders are visible, and the page is not straight. We can also see notes coming through from the other side of the page. So first of all, we need to perform a pretreatment phase before we can attempt any recognition. This process cleans the image, straightens up the page and the staff lines, and already starts to pre-classify some of the major elements. Here is the result. The ornate letter has been isolated in green, as have the title elements in yellow and the text elements in orange. The notes coming through the page have almost all been eliminated. Now we can apply the optical recognition process to this cleaned up image. This takes only a few seconds for a typical page, and we can even perform a batch process on hundreds of pages at a time, for both the pretreatment and the recognition phases. As we scroll down the recognized result, the view of the pretreated image is synchronized. We can superimpose the recognized lines onto the original, in blue, to see if there have been any errors made during the recognition process. If we find one, we can use the integrated music editor to correct the position or the character type, using the buttons provided. We can even add or remove symbols, if we need to, for example if they have been wrongly recognized or badly placed which means we very quickly have an accurate digital version of the musical content. So this was really impressive in mid-2000, and actually Arispix is still being used um, uh, actively. So in 2011, we decided to do this large uh, OMR project. So this is what's called the Libre Visualis, sort of the hymnal. Uh, and we have 2,000 pages of text and what's called a square notation. Um, so, 
this is the um, the website. So now we're doing everything, showing everything on the website, and we can do uh, different searches. This is a video, but I, I won't. I'll skip this now. But uh, so if you if you do Google Libre Dwellers and maybe McGill, uh, you'll find this page, and people have been using that. So let me go through briefly what what we had to do to get this working. Um, the video, so we'll skip that. So, we actually used Aristix to do sort of the pre processing, pre -processing to separate out different components uh, so we can figure out. So, they're color coded, so the, the text uh, in here, lyrics, title, etc. And then after that, we used the camera to recognize the symbols, and the text was sent to Acropus at that time, it was the open source uh, Google. Uh, OCR. Uh, it was a little complicated because it was a mixture of Latin and English. Uh, and then we went back to Aerospace to correct the errors. And finally, we developed what's called the Diva.js, uh, which is sort of a really fast, high resolution web based uh, presentation of our images and, and search results. So these will be a search result of the search here, it says F-G-A-C-A, F-G-A-C-A, F-G-A-C-A. Um, so this was our first attempt at large-scale Weimar. In 2012, uh, Andrew Hankinson, who was part of the Libre Visualis project, uh, uh, was very unhappy with the workflow because it was just piecemeal, so he decided for his dissertation, uh, create this workflow management system called RODAN. stands for Remote Online Document Analysis Network. Uh, remember Gamera, our monster? Well, if the Gamera goes up on the cloud, it goes RODAN. Or, yeah, that's why it's called RODAN. Um, so it's a workflow management system for large scale optical music recognition processes. Contains things like file management, cropping, noise removal, binarization, staff recognition and segmentation, symbol recognition, music reconstruction. Remember, you have to sign pitches and stuff, uh, or what we call semantic assignment. Corrections, so we need that. Then we built indices. Uh, we use solar for that, uh, so we can do quick searches of at least the melodies. All right, so this is uh, what it looks like. Uh, it's all web-based, it's a web app, and so you can do multiple uh, scores, uh, parallel processing, etc. And the result is what we're calling the Cantus Ultimus. Again, you can Google this, and you can search, uh, do a search uh, through text or notes to do that. So this is, a, this is actually a 14th century manuscript that resides in Canada, but came from uh, France. Okay, as a review of this section, let's go again through this whole process. So you have this image, gorgeous, this is from that same South Saints manuscript. Um, so first, we convert to grade scale, uh, then we binarize, then we remove the border, so we're not, you know, remember there's a pictures here. After that, we remove the text. Uh, and then we need to remove the staff. Then we do the shape or symbol classification. So we know that these things are called punk down. This is a C clock here. These are just different symbols. Uh, then we put it back again. So we put the staff line back on. Uh, then with the clef. Knowing what the clef is, we can figure out the note. So this is a C clef. So what's in the middle is C. So D, D, C, D, C, C, B, etc. Then we can put the original image back on. So we use sort of the Google Books um, paradigm where you can uh, see the, you can search, uh, and you can actually see the original images. So then we align the uh, symbols with um, the actual meaning of it, so we can search and show that. So that's sort of the uh, big picture. So this is where I will stop. So we looked at 
what is out outcome use recognition, why is it important, and look at some of the history. Thank you very much.